So I'm really excited to announce our keynote speaker today, board member of the Davis Finney Foundation and founding member of the Davis Finney Foundation Young Onset Parkinson's Disease Council, Dr. Kevin Kwok. Kevin was diagnosed with Parkinson's at the age of 48 while continuing to raise three children and maintain his lifelong career as a senior level biopharma executive. Kevin is focused on entertaining clinical, regulatory, and patient audiences around the world on a variety of Parkinson themes. He has spoken with the FDA on the importance of patient centricity in the drug development, and he recently shared his patient story on pesticide and neurotoxin exposure with Congress. Kevin is a compassionate advocate, and we are so lucky to have him here today. Please give a giant welcome to our opening speaker, Dr. Kevin Kwok. Thanks very much. Well, thanks, Jen. Can everyone hear me? Is my like my is is my microphone a little hot? Good. Did they sing my my oh let me take this off. Do you mind? Much better. I am so glad to be in, in a finally in a live audience situation after months of being on Zoom. I have to say that um and I and if my voice wavers, please please hold your hands up and tell me up the, up the volume a bit or the power. A year and a half of binge watching TV is not good for your voice. Let me tell you, my occupational therapy says TV is not going to help you project. And so with that, I, I'd like to begin my talk today. First of all, by a show of hands. How many of you here are, I have been living with Parkinson's? So about half of you. And how many, and I have to assume that the other half are caregivers taking care of your partner? For the Parkinson's patients out there, will you grab your partner's hand just and squeeze it? Because without them, we wouldn't be here. There you go. Give them a victory salute and let them know that you care about what they're doing for you. Well, while our lives are tough living with Parkinson's, their lives are no much, not much easier. In fact, it's probably even harder. So anyway, we always have to remember what they do for us. So please thank them. So let's go ahead and start beginning here. English is a very complex language, even for the native speaker. It's full of idioms, similes, and metaphors. And then there comes the issue of slang and phrases. Take, for instance, the phrase, we are all the same. We all put our legs on one leg at a time. Has everyone heard that phrase? Well, I guarantee you whoever wrote that phrase didn't live with someone with Parkinson's. Because two things, one, we're not all the same. And two, if you'd seen me put on my pants this morning getting ready for here, you would have laughed. It was Comedy Central. All. But it's one of those things that we live with. Oh, and I usually wear 501 jeans. Were you with the button fly? It's a good thing I didn't this morning because I would have been arrested for public indecency. So the theme of my talk today is a, is a theme that I've used for the last couple of years, the art of mindful pivoting. We've all had to pivot in our way in our life once we've been diagnosed with Parkinson's and have had to adjust. And I'm here today to say that we will continually have to pivot. So my speech originally was supposed to be around living with part, I, I'd actually hope to use the theme coming out of the cave in, in a Parkinson's world and living in a post COVID era. But unfortunately we're not out of the woods just yet. So many of the things that I'll be talking about today, are observations and, and tips that are even more pertinent for what we have to do. So as, as, as I was introduced, 
Uh, I've been living with Parkinson's for over 12 years now, which has been for, me, for many a, a fairly long period of time. I'm just curious out of this audience, how many have had Parkinson's for more than five years? So quite the, the vast majority of you, and how many are newly diagnosed? A few others. Well, we're all in this journey together. And so well, hopefully we'll share with you some tips on our experiences so that collectively you all will, will live and thrive well with Parkinson's. Now, everyone has a Parkinson's biography or story to tell. And I encourage you as, as we go along to make sure that you, you have a good grasp on your own story because it's an important one to say up here. In my talks with the FDA, their comments are that we all have what's called a PhD in, in Parkinson's. And by PhD, what we're talking about is a personal history of disease. What we have is uh, in many ways more pertinent than a clinician that tells you how to behave because they don't know the variability that we're going through day to day. So I encourage you all to stop me and pull me aside during the coffee break and introduce yourself and talk to me about your story because it's an important one. Just like you, I'm a fellow Parky navigating my days through this journey. And until last year, I was a lifetime biopharma executive trying to manage many different things. I was trying to manage my career, raising my kids, uh, and, and balancing friendships, all which seemed to be going sort of erratically changed once I was diagnosed. The one fortunate thing for me was I was able to pivot my career after diagnosis to turn what was my Parkinson's hobby into a well-paying career opportunity. And I'll come back to that in a minute because things changed recently during COVID. But during this whole period of time for the last 12 years, I've toured the, toured the country and the world speaking on issues of all things Parkinson's to regulators, to clinicians, to researchers. But my favorite audience is to speak to patients like you, patients and caregivers who have a story to tell. So here's, here's my story as we progress. Now I moved here from Boulder after 25 years of living in the Bay Area in California. And people ask me, why did you do that? Well, part of it was one, the quality of life here, but I was involved as a board member of the Davis Finney Foundation. And one day after a board meeting, I was chatting with Davis and Connie, his wife, and asking them, or just mentioned to them that I was thinking about a, a life adventure change. And their comment was, well, you should move to Boulder. And, and, and the comment then was, well, why? And what Connie said to me was, Kevin, I guarantee you with the strength and vibrancy of the Parkinson's community in Colorado, you will live longer and you will live a better life. So the question is, has that worked for me? Well, I'm gonna play for you a public service agree uh, a message that I'll let you be the judge for that. Hey, sports fans, how you all doing this wonderful Friday night? For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kevin Kwok, and I've been living with Parkinson's now for about 12 years. When you live with Parkinson's, you have both good days and bad days. And so I often get asked, well, Kevin, what do you do when you've had a particularly tough week like the one I just had? Well, let me show you what I've done. First of all, I grab my favorite libation out of the icebox. In this case, it's Car Camper IPA and take a long draw. This is not a beer commercial. 
Mm, that's good. And then I proceed to load up my car camper. Let me show you. This is my home on wheels. I would then proceed to find the destination, something like this. And then I proceed to cook a meal for myself, something like this. There you go, you have trout, rice from my wonderful girlfriend leftovers. And then I remember to remind myself that with all the hardships, life could still be pretty darn good. Be well, my friends, and have a great weekend. So based on your applause, I would say that I, I'm starting to adjust pretty well to life here in Colorado. I've transitioned from that wine drinking Napa Valley yuppie to a camper here in Colorado. And my summers have been really very, very good. So uh, my, my comment here was I moved here in, in 2019 and I was writing home saying, friends, I found Nirvana. The life here is in fact really, really good. You know, every day I'm going to various, you know, classes on spin, dance, uh, boxing, they were all available. And for many of us in Boulder, they were actually even free of charge. And th there was no shortage of, of great programs to be involved in. But then of course, in March of 2020, COVID came and shut down the world. And definitely shut down the world that I was starting to just enjoy uh, in Boulder. My personal history was as this all happened in the thick of it all, I lost my brother to cancer, a long battle, and I lost my job, that great job that I told you about traveling the world and talking to patients. All of a sudden that went away in a corporate restructuring. And I found myself as an island. My regular healthcare team I left in the Bay Area in California, and I was adjusting to a new one. And then I was trying to navigate this whole very, very abruptly. And I wasn't the only one going through these changes. As I looked around, I was seeing that everybody in my community was going through the same thing. And so, and part of this was not just hearsay, it was actually documented. The Michael J. Fox Foundation put out a survey that I was involved in helping to design, which was part of Fox Insights. And they pulled 7,000 Parkinson's patients to ask them, how has COVID affected your life? Well, results of that were actually published in USA Today not long ago. And what they basically said was, we aren't more prone to infection with COVID, but we definitely have, are taking it, it's taking its toll on, on um, symptoms across the board for people who have Parkinson's. And just by a show of hands, I'd like to ask you, how many of you actually felt like over the Parkinson's month, your health was actually going downhill? I, for one, am definitely one of those people. Well, through the Parkinson's uh, patient interactions that I've had with the Davis Finney Foundation, we actually verified this day to day in all of our conversations with the fellow community members. And what we noticed was not only was it affecting motor symptoms, but it was affecting non motor symptoms as well. But I noticed something very interesting about myself, and this became ever more clear to me when I went to a recent picnic uh, of, of the Parkinson's support group in Boulder, looking at all of my fellow Parkinson's tribe members. These are the same tribe members that I was writing home about when I first moved here about how vibrant they were. And I noticed that all of us had become a bit more frail. And I noticed that I used to wear large t-shirts 
I was now swimming in large t-shirts. I was actually finding that I could now adjust to medium size. And this was not a good reason for losing weight. What I actually recently saw was a posting in the Davis Finney website on sarcopenia in Parkinson's. So what is sarcopenia? I had to look this up as well, but sarcopenia is muscle wasting that happens generally as we all age. And it's a natural phenomenon that happens as we go. But those of us with Parkinson's actually, they, they feel like there's some dopaminergic response that accentuates that. And I certainly saw that in myself as we were coming through these months of COVID isolation. And I was exercising all through this period of time as well. So I was wondering what was happening. And I asked Davis, what's going on here with us? So anyway, we decided to take action and we actually joined the gym and started a workout regimen, which I will talk about in a bit. It's Quark's uh, regimen, which actually works for us. And I'll come to that in just a little bit. Then there was, by the way, there's another aspect uh, that I haven't talked about. And that's the mental health aspects of being isolated with COVID. Now, some patients with people living with COVID actually welcome this ability with the world slowing down. But I think it was, it's gone too far in the other direction. And the effects on mental health are very, very prevalent as well. So anyway, as I mentioned here, my Parkinson's health during these COVID months were hitting an all time low. My voice was frail and fragile. I started walking with a walking stick. Uh, and I just felt myself in a worse place than I was 18 months before. Which leads me now to this following statement that a friend of mine said to me once that I use in all my talks. It's when you have Parkinson's, you, you don't fake your illness, you fake your wellness. Let me repeat that statement. You don't fake your illness, you fake your wellness. Now, how many of you out there when you were first diagnosed, the response of when someone asked you, how are you doing today? You would say, I'm great, I'm doing fine. That's a pretty typical response for someone who doesn't want to belabor their hardship on someone else. I, and, in, and I applaud the people who do that because I think I was certainly one of those individuals. My comment was, everything's Jake, right? I'm living a good life and, and I'm not gonna let this get the better of me. But I'm actually here to say that maybe excessively using that I'm all good is actually something that works against you. You know, it, I realized that even with my own colleagues, I used to say, everything's fine because I didn't want them to take away any of the responsibilities that I had. I didn't want choice projects to go away. Socially, I didn't want to not be invited to that next happy hour, right? But unfortunately, what you're finding yourself going through is this almost not being true to yourself, that something is going wrong. Well, when it comes to, when it comes to this COVID era, you're not fooling anybody. It's because it's only you that are living within your, your, your ecosystem. And so there's no place to hide. And so unfortunately, what, what I said was, what, what starts off as this bravado actually becomes something that becomes almost living a charade. So part of getting through my era of COVID was admitting that maybe something isn't quite right. So as I went through this, then I asked myself, well, what can I do to improve my situation? So the first tip on here is be safe. Now, I'm not showing you a good example, showing you my yoga pose, pose you know, hundreds of feet over the city of Cape Town where I was here in this picture. 
So this is not the example of being safe by any means. But being safe is, is, for instance, coming to meetings like this, still knowing that COVID exists out there, is to make sure that we're cautious in the way we are interact with individuals. But again, not, we are in the midst of coming out of the cave, which is a good thing. It's a very good thing out there. We all need it. I mean, the fact that we have so many people here in this room tells me that we're screaming for personal contact once again. But let's just all go about it safely. And when it comes to the wor world of exercise, those of us who've been somewhat dormant for the last few months, you don't wanna quickly run out and, and train for that triathlon day one. You wanna build back up to it in there. And so that's what I mean about being safe. So I put on some of my other tips and each one of these tips could be its own one hour conversation. So I'm not gonna go into to rigorous detail on each one of them, but know that these are things that you can work on for the rest of your Parkinson's life. The first one on there is being your own best self-advocate. And I started talking about this PhD that you all have. Well, you need to be that way about your healthcare with your healthcare team. And while we put our physicians on pedestals uh, for, 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 for their training, they don't know what you're going through at, at any given minute of the day. The, 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 the fortune of having Parkinson's is that you'll never get bored with it. It's your hobby for your life, right? And then that hobby constantly is changing and shifting on you. So what you may feel this morning at 8 a.m. will not be what you're feeling Sunday morning at 8 a.m. or for that matter at 4 p.m. as the day progresses. It's very erratic and very unpredictable out there. And we are the only ones who know that. Now, my third bullet point on there is exercise, exercise, exercise. But I'm gonna put a little caveat on that. You know, at the Davis Finney Foundation, it's the cornerstone of our health and wellness. But in getting through, in getting through this period of difficult historic time for us like COVID, I'm now prefacing it by saying, have goal-based exercise as part of your life in there. Because for many of us, we've become a little bit more dormant during these months. And so I'll get a little more into the details of that as we progress. But exercise preface by doing it safely and doing it with goals. Sleep became a big issue for me during this period of time. I don't know how all of you feel, but how many of you experience insomnia out here? Quite a few of you. So what I noticed too was I, I used to be somewhat addicted to Ambien and I'm really looking forward to hearing the speech later on on home homeopathic ways for improving sleep because I've adopted so many of those. I'm actually now sleeping a good eight hours a day thanks to COVID and not having face-to-face -face meetings and traveling around. But I still am noticing one thing, even though I get eight hours, I'm tired. I'm always but tired. And there's this issue of what, what's called now excessive daytime sleepiness, which is different than insomnia and different than fatigue. I, I've been working with a number of researchers in this area, and I'm hoping that they're going to be listening to what we say when it comes to this EDS that's out there. And I think this is a field that's early in its infancy but we're going to see more as we go through more of this. But nevertheless, good night's sleep, recovery and rest are so important for all of us. Then there's mindfulness. How many of you here meditate? I see a number of you out there. When I was going through my hard period of time back in November of last year, I enrolled in a Parkinson's meditation mindfulness study, which basically meant that we had to meditate every single day for 30 minutes or more using different, different uh, modalities 
of mindfulness. And they did a study where they polled us or they had us do questionnaires on anxiety and depression and mental cognition before we started the study. And then again, eight weeks after we finished it. Well, I don't think of myself particularly as a depressed or morose guy or anxious. But when I was living through that period of time with my family uh, and, and my own personal issues, I would sort of hit the wall in many ways. And what I noticed was the before and after scale of, of, of that period after this eight week intervention was that I went from moderate scale on a scale of, I think it was 24 for depression and anxiety, where I was around a 10 before the study. I, I dropped to about three or four posts study, which is actually better than normal. And so mindfulness does work, let me tell you. And it's free, it's easy. Oh, I shouldn't say it's easy. It's a, it's a level of exercise that is just like any other drill. You gotta work at it, but it works for me. Finally, my last bullet point on here is find a partner in, in your Parkinson's journey someone that actually is a fellow person with Parkinson's because they will get what you're going through. I have my own partner who I call every day and it's like, Kevin, are you ready to go to the gym? It's wonderful to have that individual. Or when I'm sitting there stretching with him, complaining about my voice going out, he goes, well, join the crowd, right? It's really nice to know that you're not alone in all this. And through this room here, you, you, you know that you have comrades going through all of this period of time. Now, the biggest opponent of all, however, is in fact yourself. Now, I'm a big Muhammad Ali fan, even before I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And by the way, there's a small plug I'll make here for the new Ken Burns special that's coming out. The new documentary on his life is coming out pretty soon, and I can't wait to see it. Nothing moved me more than when he was, uh, when Muhammad Ali was lighting the torch at the Atlanta Olympic Games. And you could see him coming out shaking, and yet when he moved it, he brought chills to the world. By the way, that, that torch is at the Smithsonian Institute, if you ever happen to be in Washington and want to see it. It's well, for, for those of, of, of us with Parkinson's, it's one of the icon items out there that I think about. But when I'm thinking about apathy, the reason for not, the excuse for not working out, which is by the way, every single day, right? It's like I haven't eaten my, my lunch yet or I'm gonna take a nap, or maybe I'll just go tomorrow. You have to ask yourself, how do you get through that? And that's where, again, this goal-based exercise works. So I think of my, I, I think of Muhammad Ali, and, and I think of my little routine that I do in the gym. And I get inspired because I ask myself, what is the reason for exercising? What is the benefit that I'm getting from all of this? And how good do I feel after, which is probably even the most important one. So my current workout training is the following. First of all, I optimize my medication and I optimize my DVS settings so that I can exercise. But God bless me with, 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 with the gift of being just a mediocre athlete, which means that I had to dabble in many different things instead of just one thing that I did well. And because of that, I, I all my life, I was a mediocre athlete, but I had great interest and I'm very competitive, is incorporating multiple types of exercise into my regimen that worked really well for me. But what I've did, done is, uh, taking elements of different exercise modalities and trying to clump them into what do I need. So the things that I need are, and I put this now at the top of my list, stretch, 
and elongation. Because I, I happen to have the type of form of Parkinson's, which is very akinetic, the kind where you have you move really slow and you're always very rigid. And so when I when I stretch and elongation, you'll see me every morning and every night doing yoga poses at the foot of my bed to sleep better and to wake up better. Which to me, look, look my, my girlfriend sees me and they're doing downward dog at the foot of the bed, saying, what the, what the heck are you doing down there? But it's just how I relax and how I wake up. My grandmother used to do Tai Chi as a, she was Buddhist. She, she, every morning when I was a child, would, would show me Tai Chi and I'd say to my grandmother, that stuff's nonsense, right? Well, I wish I'd been a little more attentive to what she was trying to show me because now when I do Tai Chi, that whole mobility of motion, I just feel the electric, electricity surge through my body when I'm doing it. So something else that I incorporated in my workout. Uh, and then there's something that I never thought I would ever do, but I started with this at the beginning of COVID and that stands for, for Parkinson's Zoom classes. Now, my particular program I work with is with David Leventhal out of Brooklyn at the Mark Morris Dance Troupe. He was the architect of this whole dance for PD movement. And he's a fellow board member and one of the greatest instructors of all time that I've seen out there. He won, by the way, the award for, for greatest contribution to our Parkinson's community for developing this dance for PD workshop. But I encourage you to try his Zoom class because one is it's regular and two, he gets almost 150 um, participants each Monday morning in his class. And you feel like you're actually live with him when, when it happens, which is wonderful. But there are other ways that you can get involved in dance for PD. There are local programs everywhere. And I highly encourage, again, that combination of music and understanding how mo mo just movement can help elongate and, and help you relax. The second part on here is balance and agility. I joked a little bit about putting my pants on earlier today, but no joke. I mean, every time I put my pants on, it, it's, it, it's my girlfriend has a license to call the ambulance because I'm about ready to fall as I'm dangling on one leg on there. So I've incorporated multiple things that improve my balance on there and, and agility. That includes plyometrics. Um, we set up an obstacle course, my workout buddy and I, where we, could, we commandeer one room of a gym and we set up all our play toys out there which are, it's actually quite a bit of fun. I'll show you a picture on that in a minute, but they involve Bosu balls and many other things on there. I will tell you though, that the bane of my existence is jumping rope. When I used to box, I used to jump rope for 15 minutes at a time. Now I'm really lucky if I can get three skips in a row. It's part of it's aging, part of it's lethargy. Part of it's just, I suck when it comes to, jumping rope, it's not something I grew up doing, but I use that as sort of my daily report card. Can I, I was, three weeks ago before I joined the gym, I was doing two skips at a time. Now I'm, uh, and I went to my physical therapist and she said, Kevin, you'll never jump rope again. Well, I'm up to 16 lot yet last night. And before winter ends, I'm gonna hope to get up to 30 to 40. I think I'm getting there. Rock City Boxing was one of the pillars of my rehab, you know, after uh, getting in, involved, you know, with my diagnosis. And many of the skills that you get, you know, working around training for boxing really are applicable. And when it comes to this whole world of sarcopenia, I think there are many good skills in boxing. Then there's the issue of strength. and. I used to think that just going low weights, high reps was, was okay. 
but I've started to incorporate some high, high, heavier weights on there just to sort of build up muscle mass. And I'll be back in those large t-shirts pretty soon, I guarantee you. As far as aerobic exercise goes, that used to be at the top of my list, but it's moved down a bit, but it's no less important. I do a lot of cycling, both indoor and out. And high impact, high intensity exercises with sprints, I find really, really useful for me in benefiting my life. Plus it makes life a little more interesting. Indoor cycling can sometimes be a little bit dull. And so you have to find little games in order to improve that. But of course, all of that leads to being back outside and, and biking safely. And I recently purchased an e-bike, which again is something that has really changed my life as well. Let me get on here because I've only got a couple minutes left here. But this is my workout buddy and I working through. You can see me in the background and my workout buddy in front trying to balance on these bows as well. What's really fun for us is we try to mix in mental drills while we're doing this. So we'll get involved in trying to recite the months of the year backwards or serial sevens where you count backwards by, by seven. And let me tell you, it's pretty hard to balance on a BOSU ball when, when you're trying to figure out what's after 79 on there counting by seven. But my, uh, my urging to you all is take your weaknesses and make them into games. Do, don't just work your strengths, but do what's good in helping you improve yourself. And why do we do this? Well, this is my this is my secret out there. I love to ski. It's something that I've done all my life. And it's something that I thought was something behind me when I was had developed Parkinson's. This picture here shows three of us, three of us with a total year of 50 years between us with Parkinson's. All of us have had DVS. And all of us thought that three or four years ago, we were going to retire the skis and put them away, that Parkinson's, that Parkinson's had, had won over our ski. Well, let me show you on here that you can still, still ski. And, and my neurologist here over at Anschutz is highly encouraging of this. There are resources out there for you all to go to if you're interested in something like this. But for me, the joy, of feeling the wind in your hair as you are in your helmet as you're skiing down. Yeah, not too much hair for me, right? The thrill, uh, the, the thrill of, the, of, of just feeling the wind in your helmet is better than any other dopamine that I can describe. And we look pretty good out there, don't you think? But again, do it safely. Uh, what I ended up doing was enrolling in the Breckenridge Adaptive Ski Program, which is a safe way to re-enter into it. And I don't care what level of Parkinson's you have, they can get you back on safely skiing. So I close by saying, live each day in the moment. It's really important to be out there knowing that every day is a victory. And Davis Finney does this every time he finishes and wins a race. He holds his hands up like this. Hold your hands up because it's better than a fist bump anyway, right, on there. But it's really important to know that every day is a victory and everything that you attempt is not just an occupational therapy drill. It's a victory when you accomplish it. So as we progress through the course of today, you're going to hear speakers give you their tips on things that are working out there. The organizers have planned a very full day of really good speakers. And take those tips home with you uh, as you go through. But most importantly, find your joy. Find the things, whether it be skiing or running or hiking uh, or just gardening or whatever you do in your life that brings you happiness. Find that out there and then figure ways of getting back, back to it. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for your time and attention. 
I have my email on here if you're if you're call if you're zooming in. Uh, but stop me in, in the hallways if you see me and introduce yourself. Love to hear your story. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kwok. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, there will be two people. If you have a microphone, please um, raise your hand so people can see you. There'll be two microphones out in the audience. If you'll just raise your hand, someone will bring a microphone to you. Um, please do us a favor and keep your questions relevant to a more general audience. As Dr. Kwok said, he will be here. So if you have a more personal commentary, um, you can find him during the breaks and ask him. Um, but we have about 10 minutes. So I know there's a, I saw a couple here. Oh, I have one. All right, hold on. I will bring this over to you then. Hi, um, I appreciate all that you shared being vulnerable and it really helps, it helps us. Um, my question is, and I don't know if you can really address this, but as you were speaking about your skiing and your hiking and your exercising as you know, like Parkinson's really you pushed it aside. My husband has the other issues, hip issues that interfere. I think probably are other people here who have multiple you know, some other kind of issue besides Parkinson's, maybe not. But what would you suggest other than do the best you can? <laughs> uh, like boxing, or is there modified? Are there push through it? Um, you know, what, what do you say to the person who can't do all that and still wants to and has limitations, but I don't know if they're like even walking. What, what you're talking about is a very real issue. And it's one of the things that at the, at the Davis Finney Foundation we talk about is that it's all good and fine for the active, you know, Parkinson's patient, but does it work well with more advanced? And I, I think the biggest issue is, for first of all, admission that we can't do what we used to be able to do. While I'm skiing in that picture, I used to love to do bumps and moguls and ski trees. For me now, just the groomer is fine. There are people in that in my class that are in wheelchairs, and they've figured out how to uh, navigate a bucket as they're going down the hill, and they're just as fast as all the rest of us. But the key is to do it safely and not get injured going into whatever you do on there, because an injury will set us all back in the worst possible way on there. And so I think you have to balance desire with safety and capability. But there are little things that you can do along the way, right? So even if you, if I didn't ski this winter, training for it the way I've been doing in the last few weeks has been fun. And so you, you sort of build for, it's not the goal, but it's the journey that you go through in getting there that's important. That's at least how I tell myself to handle that. But, it, but it's very real what you talk about, physical capability. And it's important not to push yourself to injury because I think that will not be a good thing. Did I answer your question? Other questions out there? Yeah, we have one here. Your list of to-dos reminds me of as, as my Parkinson's has progressed, you start to feel like it owns you. Yes. And, and we need to somehow get past that. We need to say, this is part of me. It's only a part. I have to live a full life. How do you make choices and how long you go camping? How much time do you spend each day exercising? How, how do we find that balance? Well, I, I, it's, a, it's again a marvelous question. I can tell you that part of my strength and part of my weakness is I'm a stubborn ass. So I'm not gonna let, you know, while as I've had my good days and bad days with Parkinson's, just like all, everyone in this room, what I tell people is m my goal is not ma managing the highs, it's managing the troughs in my daily life. And so when you have your, your, your downsides, 
you have to ask yourself, what am I capable of doing today? And then I try to focus positively my energy on doing that. But, it, but it's a struggle and it's something we do every day. Uh, and ask me this in about another two years and I may tell you the whole different set of rules on this. But I think we all have to find our own way that meets our, our personalities and our capabilities. I talk a lot about personal capability. I, I know that a few years ago, one of my good friends had an infection in his DBS unit. And this was one of the most active people that I know with Parkinson's. And all of a sudden they had to rip it out because of the infection. And he went from world-class athlete to all of a sudden saying, I can't even roll over in the bed and put the sheets over myself because I'm paralyzed, you know, from the, from the neck down. Well, his comment to me was, we have to be more conscientious of those that are, are now going into stages, which we, we used to say, just power through it. That doesn't work. Telling us all that, you know, Parkinson's is something that we can just kind of ignore eh, is a macho approach and it's not really holistic for the band, the masses. Again, I'm getting a little bit um, pontificating on there, but it, it, it works for me. Any other questions out there over here? It's part and part of Parkinson's. COVID just allowed me more hours to sleep. So I knew that it wasn't just the number of hours. It's the quality of sleep that you get out of it that I think is in question. And I, I'm doing some pro bono work with a, with a biotech company now that's looking very specifically at, at the indication EDS because they feel like if we can improve the quality of sleep, not just the number of hours of sleep, that in fact, it will have a, a positive effect on us. They, they're, they're going into trials right now with the FDA and hopefully it'll be something. I mean, I, I, I've talked to them about how this daytime sleepiness and functioning well during the day is probably the number one issue that I have on my list. Uh, because without good sleep, and, I mean, if you were to see me, you could put me with my kids in the most action-packed movie, and I'm sitting there snoring in about 10 minutes into the movie. I mean, I, I don't even care what movie it is. I'm just, you know, knocked out on there. So I think the phenomenon of EDS is something we're going to learn more about in the years to come. Great question, though. Okay, we have time for one more question. Mine at, hi, thank you so much for all you've said and shared. Um, mine actually had to do with you, a throwaway comment you'd made that's relative to sleep. You said you'd gone off Ambien and gone into homeopathic um, sleep, and you've been getting better sleep with that. And so I was curious if you could share a little more, or if that's the EDS. Yeah, you know, I... You know, I used to travel a lot internationally and I always kept Ambien a small amount of one or two tablets, you know, in my travel bag. And I would only use it in emergencies, you know, on long cross uh, transoceanic flights. But I found as my partners started advancing that I would be taking them all the time instead of just travel. And I don't know if it's called an addiction, but I definitely have started needing it every night to sleep. And my girlfriend will sit there and tell you, Kevin, you used to call me after taking an Ambien and you were a zombie. You were speaking a language that I couldn't even understand on there. And so I realized that I was going down a very slippery slope with Ambien. And so, I was fortunate that my neurologist picked up on it and she stopped refilling my, my, my prescription. 
And so it forced me to start thinking about other ways of sleeping better. So I, I personally, I tried melatonin through the years, but I found that melatonin started helping more than it used to. And then I started shifting to CBD type, you know, medication. And then all of a sudden, you know, combining that with relaxation techniques in, in mindfulness, I think I found a formula to increase the hours, but I'm still not there yet getting the quality of sleep, which is the next, the, the next part of that task. Great question though. Thank you so much, Dr. Kwok.